All right, everyone, I'm Danny studying with Project Dragonfly. And in this video, I'll be giving you a real quick rundown of what are microsatellites and hopefully spark your curiosity to learn more about them or maybe use them in the future. First and foremost, what are microsatellites? Well, microsatellites are small segments of DNA with tandem repeats of two to five nucleotide sequences. An example of this would be 10 repeats of the dinucleotide cytosine and adenine. So an entire section of CA, 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 pretty much CA repeated 10 times, which would look something like this. These repeat sections in the DNA are special because they are relatively abundant in the genome and have high rates of mutation when compared to other sections. This is because these areas easily undergo what is known as DNA slippage, which is when polymerase synthesizes or copies the DNA. It can accidentally skip a beat or add one too many beats of the repeat pattern to the whole segment. So let's take our previous example and expand on it a little. And let's say we have two fish, peacock bass, PB1 and PB2 from the same population. It is possible for the two individuals of the same population to have fish PB1 with 10 repeats or 20 base pairs and fish PB2 with eight repeats, so 16 base pairs for the same microsatellite location. Because slippage can occur and these sites don't code for critical enzymes in the body, these minor mutations are harmless to the individual, but comparing many of them can give us an idea of how related the two individuals might be or if they are two different species entirely that just might look alike. Let's expand on our example again and add two peacock bass from a new population at a lake far away from the first lake that is barely connected through convoluted rivers. We will call the new samples PB3 and PB4. And let's say PB3 has 16 repeats of AC for a total of 32 base pairs and PB4 has 18 repeats for a total of 36 base pairs within the same microsatellite we analyzed for the first two specimens. After looking at a few more microsatellites and analyzing them, we can see that the differences between the samples from population one versus samples from population two show that they are in fact two distinct populations with almost no interbreeding, but are still related enough to be the same species due to a few microsatellites having similar values. Now that we understand more about what they are, we can better explain how they are used. After the specific microsatellite sequences are identified for a species, we can then take an individual's DNA sample and copy the microsatellite gene along the stable regions flanking it to ensure we catch all the base pairs and differences within the microsatellite. Now these flanking regions are stable and the same no matter how many repeats within the microsatellite. So two individuals in the same species or even genus or family will always share the same amount of base pairs for the flanking region as they are usually connected to essential enzyme coding or other important functions. Microsatellites, like many other DNA methods, are copied using polymerase chain reaction techniques that replicate the segment of DNA with fluorescent tips. These fluorescent tips are then fed through a microcapillary electrophoresis and then analyzed by a machine to tell you exactly how many base pairs there are in your individual's microsatellite. Now remember, the number fed out is the total segment, not just the microsatellite. So if you use our example from before and it has two flanking segments of 20 base pairs flanking it, PB2 with the eight repeat will read 56 total base pairs and PB1 with the 10 repeat will read 60 total base pairs. Do this with a few more individuals and a few more microsatellites and you can find population diversity, speciation, taxonomy, population size estimates, and many other genetic diversity facts just from comparing several microsatellites. There are many programs that can analyze microsatellites to give us the information we might be looking for. For example, FSTAT, Bottleneck, and Service can do minor things like give you heredity statistics. In some cases, it is as simple as inputting the amount of base pairs found for each sample at each individual microsatellite and getting an output of statistics like FST, which tells you how related the populations might be. More complex programs such as NeoGen, Structure, and Gene Class can output more detailed statistics, 
such as NE or population size estimates, and whether or not two separate populations are distinct species. However, the majority of the programs base a lot of statistics behind it off of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. That is, yes, that Mendelian p-analysis on steroids that you learned about probably in Bio 101. So it actually isn't as complicated as it sounds. Now to the real question, is microsatellites right for your genetic study? More likely than not, yes. If you are studying population genetics, heredity, wild populations relatedness, and population size, or determining speciation and genetic fitness of wild animal populations, then this is the right thing for you. Microsatellites are excellent because they give statistical backing to research papers and environmental studies that might be trying to prove a small pop population size or like in the case of Willis et al, trying to understand interbreeding separate populations of peacock bass in the Amazon. It can even be used like Santos, who proved that a separate species of peacock bass was introduced to a river and causing hybridization between two species of peacock bass in the area using microsatellite analysis. One of the only cons with microsatellite use is that it is not accessible everywhere. For example, for someone studying an endangered species in the remote area of Madagascar, they might not have access to the equipment needed to analyze and prepare DNA samples, or even be able to collect DNA samples in the first place from the animal that they're looking at. However, there are workarounds to this, such as using portable PCR equipment to create your amplifications before freezing it and then sending them off to a lab to find some real results. Another issue with microsatellite use is you need several microsatellite sites, with the average accepted amount falling in at around 10 microsatellites in order to really find out speciation and relatedness between individuals and populations. Arthur Ter et al. found that having eight microsatellite sites was 95% effective at determining where individual flies came from, which population they were from, and what the separate species were. So that kind of gives you an idea of how many you really might need if you really want to know the nitty gritty about, your, about a population or if you don't know if two separate populations might be related at all. All things considered, microsatellites allow for excellent advancements in genetic diversity. And with new analyzation softwares, they have become a useful technique for conservation efforts and environmental population studies. All right, that's all I have to share with you, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to find out more about microsatellites, check out these references right here. And if you are looking to use microsatellites yourself, I would definitely recommend starting with Kin and Sappington's 2013 article that goes directly into programs to use and how they are applicable. Catch up with you in the next Dragonfly assignment.